All right. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we had a crash there because Unity was flipping out on us. But now we're back into the swing of things here. So we'll just consider this part two since that other video was like 30 minutes long. All right. So we'll hop back into the window here. So we pretty much figured out how to do um, all of the, uh, the setup for our basic slots here and setting up our rows and our attributes and all this information for the the name and the uh, basic player information so the next thing that we're going to go into is just bit looking at the drawing of the character here in our equip slots right so the next thing would since we already went over the stats in our our inventory slots here let's look at the equip slots and the portrait right so this info is just the name and the level which is obviously like I said, it's applied to the apply inventory window, update attributes, um, and this is going to be uh, the name, the level, and name and level is obviously tied to those game objects. So that's where those is coming, goes, those come from. Um, but the equip slots is are basically just set it up into left and right, and the portrait in the middle here. And this is all using um, uh, layout elements, grid. Uh, horizontal layout groups, uh, all layout elements. This is all stuff that comes with Unity here. So it's pretty cool stuff. Helps you get your stuff nice and organized and uh, symmetrical. So on my left slots here, you'll see that I actually do use the method that I told you guys last time about It's if you're not having to want to do the whole slot row backs and then your actual rows and slots, then you can simply like put that background as the parent here and then um, do the actual slot here which contains the the item image but uh, you can do that on your own if that's how you want to do it but basically we divide all of our stuff in into slots right since these are individual slots they're not just general bag slots they need to act that way right so this slot we actually give it the name right this doesn't do its own naming on start we want to supply it a name okay so we give it a name of slot head Right, and the naming doesn't matter, mind you. So we do have to give it though a type slot of head. We also want to give it a type of item is equipable. So only head items can be equipped here. And we give it also a check to make sure it is an equipable item. We also make sure that if we, these are equip items and we want to make sure that these, uh, these slots do check to make sure the classes are correct between items that we give this bool a check here um, and that's pretty much that nothing is on the blocks here so it's pretty much just all done in the script so that's the head slot go into the neck we give it a type of slot neck make sure it's knowing that we need to make the, any item that can be here is an equivalent item and we do want to check for class for our deck slots so same thing that goes all the way down the list. Now for resources, um, we can check for resource if we want. Maybe we want to limit some potions to certain classes, um, depending on your game. Um, but we do change this type of slot to resource. But we do want to change this to type of item is consumable, right? So that way we know that only consumable items can come here and only uh, resource items can come here, right? So that's a kind of like a double check. Obviously, if it's a resource, it's generally going to be a consumable, right? So those kind of go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. Uh, same thing for weapons and things like that, right? So it's a type of weapon. It's an equipable, right? And we do want to have a class requirement. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. The portrait now is going to look at the... It's going to be looking for a raw texture it's going to be looking for a character render texture. And this is something I've already created for you guys. Right? So our character render. Now in our player, we're going to look at our render camera that we have in here. And it's only set to look for things on the tag of item and player. Right? And we just kind of have like a green screen effect back here. Something I put there. That doesn't actually show. Right? It's just I like having the, the color on there when I do want to do some debugging with it. But that's where the render camera. So the render camera is basically just going to output whatever it's looking at into this target texture. 
right? And this is something that we created. So we just drag that into the output field there. Now, when this camera, when the player's in the scene, and the camera is obviously going to be in the scene with him, it's going to send all that information to this texture. And this raw image is looking for this texture that we drag as the prefab here, and it's looking for that data. So that's how we get this constantly streaming update of info to the portrait here of the player. So if you're ever wondering how to do that stuff, same thing works um, for mini maps. Um, same thing works for all that stuff. It uses uh, raw images with the render textures. Obviously, you could also take do things like, uh, this is totally off topic, but you can do things like when your scene starts and you want to do a mini map, you can basically take a picture, quote unquote, of your scene from a very high altitude, take a picture of it, save it as a texture physically in your game, and then apply that to a raw image component. And then you can kind of just get like a snapshot of what your scene is. That way it's not like a constantly updating thing that'll show like trees blowing in the wind. It'll just be a snapshot. Totally off topic. Don't know why I talked about it, but there you go. <laughs> Little gem that you could have there. Um, so yeah, that's basically slots. It's very straightforward. Uh, you know, all, obviously all the codes are done for you guys. Now the drag reference is a little cube here that's set to 23 by 23. Now what this is, is it's obviously set to something that when we drag. So if we drag an item, right, this is always gonna be set to the player's mouse position, which is why the anchor is set to up, up there. So if this was a, a an in-game scenario, it would actually be looking exactly like this. The picture would be filled in right here and it would be anchored just like this on our mouse. So that way, you know, our item is kind of just off centered right there. It's set to this size. So that's what that's that's what the drag system uses. When we drag, it fills this sprite with the items sprite that was currently on there. Um, so that's that. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's all pretty straightforward here. So just to run down to this, whenever you create new rows, make sure to add that row, go into your rows, it's going to know if your row is valid because your rows has this slot initialization, right? And this is looking for types of slot initialization. So you just drag that uh, into the field. And you could add as many rows as you like uh, inside there. Same thing for equip slots. Um, you drag and drop that. Blah, 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 blah. Drag and drop the actual slot from there. So not th this thing, but the actual slot that contains the script apply inventory slot on there, right? So for head, just to demonstrate for you guys, we drag and drop and plop head onto there. Super simple. This has apply negative zone, just like our apply negative field that stretches the whole screen. This isn't inventory, so when we drag things onto here, they're gonna drop from our player, right? So this physically dropping the item. Our apply inventory window also has this component, but it is the inventory. So that way when we know, if we're dragging an item, and let's say we drop it on the portrait, or we drop it in this field, or we drop it in like the corners in this empty space up here, right? We know that we don't wanna drop it. We don't wanna unequip it from the player. We don't wanna drop anything from the bag. We're just gonna send all that information back to the slot, and then we'll be fine. You know, we won't be dropping the item from the scene. So that's why we have this bool here. We also have apply window control, which is set to toggle. So if we press I, it'll open the window. If the window is open, um, then it, when we press I, it'll close it. Or if the window is open and we press escape, then we'll close the window. So this can be toggling the window and this will close the window. This isn't gonna open the window. So I should, I should probably rename this to just close the button, but whatever, you guys get the idea. Um, that's all it does. And it just has a canvas group and an animator. The animator sends this alpha from one to zero, zero to one in a, a lerpy type fashion and then sets the interactable and block rate casts to false. So that way we can't drag and drop items when this thing is fully set to zero. So that's a basic way to hide your hide and show your windows when with using the animation system that comes with Unity so we can fade the window in and out instead of having pop in and out like we live in 1990 playing games. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so character window, apply inventory slots, bam, 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 good, good, negative field's good. 
Bam. Okay. Now, tooltip menu. Uh, it's something very straightforward. It's basically carrying references to all of our tooltip objects. So, name, damage, armor, durability, level, restriction, slot, uh, type, rarity, attribute to doc. Attribute to doc isn't the attributes. It holds the attributes. And the attributes are actually... Um, should be in apply tooltip so what it does is whenever we hover over something it's going to bring in an attribute and it's going to parent it to the dock so you see here that it parented to the dock right and it put it in its correct position so if we were just to bring this in and parent it to the tooltip what would it do our attributes would be at the very bottom and we don't want that we want them to be in the middle here right under our general information and just before value. So if we have seven attributes on this item, right, then it's going to create seven of these things and it'll all look correct. All right, so that's what the dock is used for. It's not an actual element like these. You know, these things have text and all that stuff, just as the prefab does. All right, so it'll just instantiate. Now, don't worry about the value here because when it does instantiate, which I'll show you on the item, uh, when it does instantiate, it sets this information here to whatever the information is set to our item. So I just have this here just as, you know, eye candy so I know what everything looks like when it's physically in there. So don't worry about that. Uh, back to this. Yes, yeah, so this, like I said, this just saves references and then this just saves whatever the current item that we're hovering over saves a reference to this script so that way this script can reference it directly and it doesn't have to keep talking back and forth you know, to other various scripts. It just gets a reference directly and keeps it so we know. Um, yeah, and that's that. Um, yep, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, let's see. Fender window will go into last. But the save, we'll go in the save load system here. Uh, yeah, we're only at 12 minutes for solid. Okay, so when you are creating your ply game load safe system you're going to want to create a profile right so excuse me so when you're creating a ply game profile you could save i believe if i'm not mistaken you can Yeah, you, I think you, you should be able to do it to, to strings or um, integers, right? But for the sake of my simple demo here, I'm just doing it to integers. But what my save and loading system does, since it's only specific to items, right? And your, your player item information has nothing to do with my save and load system, has nothing to do with Ply Game, since Leslie handles all that stuff for you guys. Mine is just a separate thing for items. So what I do for you guys here is I basically just allow you to save your items under a profile, right? Now, what usually if you're doing stuff with Ply Game here, obviously you're gonna wanna make sure your profile, you know, your Ply Game profile um, is like whatever profile you're on is talking to this script, right? To the canvas um, and it's setting this string here in this script to whatever your profile is that's handled by Ply Game, right? So if you're using this kind of stuff, Right, or if you want to use my system and use the profile name you set here, you can set your low save profile to something what of my script. You get the value from my script and set it here. So it can work either way, doesn't matter. It, just know that this is how my system works, you know. So when you're doing my stuff, you're calling save in my script, it's a function in my script, my IO manager, right? You're calling save with the parameter of zero. When you're doing Leslie stuff, you're setting the profile, right, to the like the first profile, which is zero. And you're also setting his save to his slot zero. So you're setting mine to my slot zero and his to his slot zero. So if you're wanting to manage these manually, make sure you're setting these to the same value, okay? So I just wanted to fully disclose that two different load safe systems, two different purposes. So keep that in mind, okay? A cool feature that does come with 
my system though that I've included here for you guys is obviously, you know, the general naming of the profile without going to the details here, which I will go into. But you can also create a file type. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're simply just going to uh, navigate off window here just for a second, uh, just so I can show you guys what this actually looks like. Because I thought it was a really neat idea to add in here for you guys. Uh, so we'll go up to here, bop, 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 bop. Okay. So, if you guys look at this folder layout, which I hope this shows up in the recording. But anyways, yeah. So you guys can come in here and you'll look in your, in your local, in your user which is me, you go into, uh, it's a hidden folder called app data to local low. And then this is just what I have it set to, I think for this one. And so the default company is this, I think it's set in your player's settings. Then mine's Diablo inventory. And what it does is basically takes the profile name and it, what it does is it creates a folder inside of this directory manually for you. Then, Right, so if we were to save the game, then what it does is it'll take that profile name with the slot that we specify it to, and it'll also create the save. And what it does is as long as you give this a proper name, and it could be anything, it can be, you know, file type, can be data, or it can be just called save, right? So you can actually name and make your own file types the way you like Skyrim and Fallout and all them do, right? Because it's just binary data that they're saving in there most of the time. So it's a cool little system. So that way you guys can personalize your games and personalize your load and save files for your players. So that way they know, hey, what is a ply save file? Oh, this must be for my ply game game. You know what I'm saying? So you could name this, or you could just name it like whatever your game is. If your game is named Angry Cats, then it could be called Angry Cat Save, or what have you. All right? So it'll obviously auto automatically add the dot and then the save, uh, the file type for you. So that's that. So obviously you you do want to have a, a name here. Just think of a cool little name that you got. You know, it doesn't really matter. Now this folder here is for the non ply game version. So for the non ply game version, I just have my things as a, they're just called save files. But for you guys, I, you know, I just gave it the default of ply save. So just change it to whatever you want, it doesn't matter. So that's how my system works for this. That was a cool little thing that I can add in there for you guys. Um, but basically down to the nuts and bolts of what this is doing is when you save your game, it's gonna add, and these are public lists, so it's going to add, let's say you have five items equipped. It's going to get all those add items and add it to this list. So this is item, 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 blah, 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 right? It's going to get all your bagged items, right? So let's say you had 15 bagged items, and it's going to add it to this list. Once it's added to the list, it's going to talk to that binary save file that we've created, and it's going to save all that information to that file, okay? Now, once it does that, right? Um, and these references to the inventory manager right here is so the in inventory manager is basically saying okay get all the stuff from the equip slots get all the stuff from the bag from the player right and that's what that's what this is handled yeah, that's why we need that reference but anyways so this is how this is working gets our equipped items gets our bagged items that's why this is eqvg right um, i should probably make this zero just in case funky joke to go on um, but yeah that's basically what that does right now um, you'll see here that there's the save the load delete slot delete profile events for the playing game IO handling right so when we are saving um, it runs all this logic here now when we're loading since we did save all that information to a data file, right, which is this, it's our, this is our data file, right, since we saved all that information there, when we load the game, you'll see now that we can go into our player and look at that block that I told you guys about, it's going to check, okay, 
is this a new game? If we're loading a game, obviously it's not a new game. And we check that in our load game button in the main menu. We set new game to false. Then we call the load on ply IO manager and ply system IO test, ply IO manager. We call the load function with parameter what our load parameter should be, right? Then all the data in there, it'll pull the data from our file and then it'll fill it up here. So that way you're carrying the, the information from your save. You can come out of play mode, exit Unity, come back five years later, open up Unity if there's not 2000 updates by then, and then load the game. This will get populated with the information that we saved when it first pooled all of our information. It'll let us know, okay, we have five equip items on our guy. And we have 15 items in our bag. So what we need to do when we're you doing the item loader, we need to give this item, we need to give these to these slots on the player. And we need to give these to the player's bag. And we need to give him his weight back. We need to give him his currency back. And we need to give him all that information that came with those items back to him, right? And that's how this is all handled. So that's how the data is transferred over. Now, if we actually physically go into this file here, um, let me see if I can uh, just quickly show you guys here. Um, uh, let's open up Notepad++. Close out some of these. That's fine. We'll leave those open. But you'll see here it's saved in some binary format, but some of it is actually pretty legible, right? So we have our apply player data, which is our, our custom class. It's and it's saving current currency amount, currency type, our max currency amount, saving our currency weight, um, or our current weight, I'm sorry. It's saving our max weight. It's saving all of our equipped items, it's saving all of our bagged items. Right, and these are generic lists, right? And then it's coming down here and it's letting us know that this is actually from my, when I saved my save file here, these are actually two items that I have, right? So this is what it saved from my stuff and as, as well as with this information right here. And these are actually my files. So this is uh, just a code so if you anyone play fallout out of skyrim and you use console commands this probably looks pretty familiar and you can name these to whatever you want so this is for me it's potion underscore mana potion right zero one potion health potion so you can kind of look through this and kind of get an idea this is right here is zero zero one quest so this lets me know this is the first quest item that i made zero zero five armor oops I shouldn't change that. There's our five armor underscore neck. So this is a simple naming convention that I've made for myself here. And you know, you can kind of just go through here and get a pretty decent idea of how the whole system works, which is always nice. But yeah, that's pretty much um, how the whole load safe system works. I hope you guys got a nice idea of how this all is working and then how to trigger your own stuff here when you're uh, when you're working off the save system. So that way, this is going, when we press the save button, that's what this is calling. It's calling this right here on the ply blocks. Um, yeah. And then that way, so when we load, we already know all the data saved in those global variables. Um, so that way when we know when we load and we fire that start event on our player, we're getting that load param and new game. So, you know, <laughs> I've probably been rambling around in circles here and you probably guys are probably tired of me talking uh, but uh, I just want to go over the vendor system before I close this video out because we probably have about five minutes left <sighs> okay so uh, it looks pretty similar to the inventory window over here minus the crazy attribute stuff um, so yeah so basically it's letting us know when the current slot we're hovering over so don't fill this in with your stuff because it's just gonna get overwritten so if you want to buy an item we bind it to a key. If we want to prime an item for quantity activi act blah, uh, activation, we hover, right, we're hovering over an item, we're holding left shift while we're hovering over that item, 
and then we left click. So primer, holding left shift, activators, and we click that mouse button. So that's what these two keys. These two keys work in conjunction. This is just kind of that quick buy method, right? Just spamming your right mouse button. This is giving us a link to our vendor's title and our vendor's currency. And this is, let me expand this here. Vendor information, name and trade, right? So it's gonna look for our vendor. And we actually have our vendor here. His name is some crazy madness and his trade is trader. Right, so we could easily name this blacksmith, leather worker, meat, truck guy, you know, whatever you guys want. Um, so yeah, so it basically saves uh, things to that. So yeah, obviously we have a bunch of rows for this guy here, which I'll probably never <laughs> end up using for the demo. Uh, but I just wanted to give you guys a big window so you can see. So obviously he has nine rows starting at index of zero. So we just fill all that information in here. So that way you, it, this also does a naming convention. So same system, the slot row backs, you know, obviously it's pretty cumbersome <laughs> and ugly if you're working on the hierarchy, but it's just the easiest way that I thought to do it for myself. So all these things, they don't have ply inventory slots. They have ply vendor slots. So you'll see that they're missing the two enumerations up here. And that's obvious because we're not going to be sending information to this thing, right? We're just going to be getting information from it. So we just need to know the basic stuff we're hovering and if this is occupied by an item. So that way when we're generating his inventory, we know that you know this slot's occupied so that this other item that we're trying to send to it is to be in the slot over from it. Uh, so that's how that whole thing works. Uh, nothing in the ply blocks, they're just there. Uh, okay, so back to the... Oh yeah, and these also have row initializations on them as well. So I'll make sure to do that because like I said, row initialization is gonna be what's working off of naming all these slots, their actual uh, indexed names so you can track them. So other than that, we can then look at our uh, quantity window. So this is gonna let us know that our window for when we want to buy more than one thing and we prime it all that's all this information, right? Um, this right here is linked to the item name, which is this text here. This is linked to the uh, the max quantity. Now the max quantity is probably a terrible naming convention what I did for this, but basically what max quantity is doing is it's limiting the, um, the input, uh, input field here to a character limit of two, right? So that way, when we have the content type set to integer, we can never buy more than, you know, we can't put in some crazy number like this. We can only put two characters in. So the max technically can be 99, right? But obviously, you know, if you buy 99 things, your sister's, your, your system's gonna be hung up for, you know, probably like a second or so. Yeah, because that's a lot of, <laughs> shit to buy so uh, just be aware of that so if you guys want more stuff from your from your guy uh, you could always extend this to a max quantity of three so that means you could have three character slots you know when you're typing out so it could be a max of 999 if you were to put three in here so uh, that's that so i usually keep that two because you normally aren't going to have more than 99 slots and then this is just the quantity input field. So this is working off the same way that kind of like our load save does, but only for the generation part of it, right? So this, you're not gonna mess with any of this stuff, just as you're not gonna mess with any of the load save stuff. This is all stuff that's generated when we run our guy's information. Um, so this has, he also has a vendor window component. Um, so we can close the window by pressing escape. And this is just letting us know if the window's open. This also has a ply negative zone field. So that way, if we drop anything into this guy's window, um, it's just gonna um, send it back to our bag. It's not gonna drop it from the world, right? So um, that's a little uh, component that we put on there. Um, but other than that, we can actually just kind of get into our guy uh, physically in here. The cancel button is pretty simple. Uh, 
it's going to talk to our vendor manager and fire a function basically just closes this window uh, the submit button is a function that talks to our script uh, our vendor script and basically says okay buy these 99 items of stuff so you don't have to any, ever mess with this stuff just make sure when you're making these buttons it's talking to apply vendor manager buy quantity and uh, apply uh, vendor manager reset quantity window uh, yep pretty much all for that so let's go into the vendor so the vendor is a simple npc set them up just as we would npcs right so we start with apply blocks always at the top don't worry about the script we give you know give them the actor give them the persistent object controller nav mesh blah 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 blah. if you're using unity pro i think is what nav mesh uses and then yeah so he set as a layer of npc so we already set up his name his trade his bag obviously needs to be set up right so that way when he gets all of his items spawned into the world they get nice as parented under his bag game object which is, yeah which is right at his feet and then they get set to a layer that's hidden from our camera which is how our system works as well uh, for our guy and then um what we can do here is we can actually give him a currency amount. So his current currency amount is going to be obviously his current currency, which is which will be persistent throughout this whole scene, right? Now, what we can also do is every time we interact with this guy, we can give him a range, right? So every time we interact, if this bool is checked, right, or when the scene starts technically, it's going to give him a currency from 360 to 725 gold in our case so this will generate a range super simple you can use it if you want use it if you don't want uh, this list right here is basically saying okay we want this guy to always have a health potion and a mana potion at all times we know we want him to have these items right now depending on if we buy this item and we wanted to remove it from his his store supply that's a different story. That's physically on the item itself. You can set it to infinite in the cell options for it. But we do know that when this guy's inventory gets generated, we do want him to have a health potion and a mana potion, whether it be infinite or just one each, right? Then we have a separate bool that we can activate. So if we don't have this activated, he's just going to give us a health potion and a mana potion, infinite or non infinite. If we do have this set, then that, what it's going to do is going to say, okay, from our pool of items, let's say this is 200 items long, right? And we just drag in an item, uh, we collapse one of these windows, collapse the player, don't do it. We just drag in an item, let's say, uh, armor, head. Yeah, we can add in another head item. So we just pop it in the list here, right? So out of like this 100 list of items, right? It's going to get four random items from this list, and it's going to add it to his, you know, his sub item list. So we know we're starting for a fact we're going to have these two items. Or if we want five items, we know for a fact we're going to have those five items. But if we're randomly generating, that's where the, the items to add in the fresh item list comes in. So we're, we may get, just by chance, we may just get five helmets this one time we interact with them. Or next time we make it one helmet, two maces, and three boots of greed, right? So this is all just the random generation amount. And you can obviously, if you want to generate the whole list, you know, then, you know, we can go 15 or 16, right? So it's going to iterate through this thing 16 times and just get a random item each time, right? So this item can be more than what this is. These, these two don't have to correlate. So yeah, that's that. So that's just how I have it set up here. So basically the interaction is gonna be when we're in the game and you know, let's say our guy is like this with a top-down camera and whatnot, and we hover our mouse over him and press E, which is how we have it bound here, then as long as we're within an interactor interact in interaction range of four, we'll be able to talk to this guy and open up his shop. So that's what this interaction stuff is doing here. Other than that, this script is pretty much straightforward. You can give him some for sure items, and then you can also generate new items. Very straightforward. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for all this stuff. We've been doing it for about 35 minutes here. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to not save because I don't know what I, madness I've done this time around. Um, and we're going to maximize on play, of course. And I'm just going to recap everything for you guys here. So we've loaded. We're going to run. And we're into our game. We have all of our attributes, our weight, and all of our information. We have our guy, that render texture. We have all of his stats, all of our slots. We have all of our items, okay, all of our stuff being picked up. We can, you know, slot some of our stuff here. Get our boots and our helmet. Come talk to good old Bob over here. Actually, Mouth is his name. So we can right click. We can drag into the inventory and it'll just get sent back to here. Or if we drag into the world, it'll get dropped, right? Or if we right click, it'll sell, right? So now you've seen that he's generating. Let's see, he's actually generated two glistening chokers and two padded helmets, right? So that's what he's generated this time. So we can actually run away from him and then open him back up. And you'll see now he has three necklaces and one helmet. So let's just close him out, open it, three helmets, one necklace. A necklace, two boots, and a helmet. Uh, two necklaces, two helmets. Uh, okay, so we got some swords this time and some boots. Uh, helmets... Necklace and swords. So you obviously you guys get the idea here. It just randomly generates items. You can generate this whole thing, and he does actually know when too much is too much. So you can give him, you know, if your thing is only five, you know, slots big, and you give him a pool of five hundred items, and let's say your items you want to generate is five hundred as well, he'll know that he has too many items because he'll say his it'll give you a debug saying his inventory is full. So it'll just scrap all the other stuff you tried to instantiate for him. I just hit my mic. Uh, but yeah, so that's how all this system works here. Um, I'll probably show you guys how this works here. So just show you how the system kind of does hang up for a second here. Uh, we'll spawn 25, and you see there was a small little hiccup, um, but it did spawn a pretty decent quantity of our stuff here. Um, so we'll go ahead and... Oh, yep, we're too heavy. <laughs> we can't buy those loot. But we can actually equip that, and then we're good to go. So yeah, that's how we've we've looked at the whole GUI system, how it works, how to set up your own stuff, how to set up your vendors, and kind of look at all this stuff. So the next video is going to go into in depth. Um, we're going to actually create our items. We're going to look at the custom uh, editor that I created for you guys. That's included in the Play Game window. And we might be able to get more in-depth into the persistence and the loading and saving and how to tweak some of those values and then go into the scripts themselves and actually tweak the values in the scripts uh, if you don't like anything that I've given you guys uh, for default. So hopefully the next video is going to be our last video and we can wrap everything up uh, uh, from there and you guys can be on your way. So thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.